Well, hello, hello, hello. May God bless you and keep you. That's been my prayer for you all week. This is the life show where we are living in faith effectively. My name is Daryl Harris. I'm the host of this program. So glad and elated that you've joined us tonight. And we just want to give God praise for your presence and your being here. Thanks for stopping by. In fact, you have tuned in to something that's quite different. Look, there's a lot going on in this world today. Of course, we know it can all be solved when our faith is strengthened in the Most High God. And so we're grateful to be here tonight. Want to give a shout out to WCR, Worship Center Radio, for hosting this program. This is a great and talented group of people who I'm very blessed to have met, I'm very blessed to be in partnership with in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ and hoping to center lives in the body of Christ. So we're excited to be here tonight. We know that the weather is uh, kind of dwindling down. Still excited, however. Uh, someone said, well, I guess the hawk has finally got out of the cage. We're glad because God extended uh, some time to us and gave us some very pleasurable uh, weather over the last few days. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe earlier this week, started off somewhere in the 70s. One of these days, we almost hit 80. In November, sounds crazy. Of course, everybody's saying, well, you know that means that Jesus is on his way back. That doesn't mean that Jesus is on his way back. That's happening because Jesus is on his way back. And so we are just excited uh, to enjoy this weather. And although, you know, it's cooling off and things are kind of coming down, we're still excited. Just have to put on the jacket, uh, get your gloves out, put your sweaters out. Everything's going to be all right. Get a couple of hot cocoa, tea, you'll be just fine. Look, I want to start off tonight by um, just thanking everyone who was involved, who was able to be present and attend my 20th pastoral anniversary celebration that happened on last night at the Athena Hall on the east side of Detroit, in Metro Detroit. Look, I'm so excited. It's been 20 years, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful to the team uh, that put uh, the banquet together, worked very diligently. I'm grateful to the ministry uh, who supported the banquet as best they possibly could. It was just wonderful. And then to all of my extended friends who were able to show up, and even those who were not able to be there, but most certainly uh, they called and, and gave their uh, uh, points of celebration and gave their comments just how grateful uh, they were uh, of our operating in ministry for 20 years. I know a lot of people that are not able to do a whole lot of things for 20 years, let alone 20 weeks, 20 hours, sometimes even 20 minutes can be a long time. So I want to just say to God that I'm very grateful uh, that he has blessed us to be in operation for 20 years. And then I also want to say to the ministry, to the family and friends and all those who have supported the ministry these 20 years, help us out by continuing to pray for us that we'll be able to go on another 20 years. I just want to really give a special thanks, however, uh, to Bishop James Williams, uh, who is the senior pastor and bishop of the Spirit and Truth Christian Ministries. He came and brought a word that was second to none. It was so encouraging to hear him speak on the subject, the road less traveled. I mean, it was awesome as he orated about how we as Christians need to understand that wide is that path to destruction, Jesus says, and narrow is that path to life, and very few you find on it. Sometimes we complain about how lonely this path can be, uh, uh, how often uh, it is that we really run into genuine people who are seriously and genuinely and sincerely trying to do their best to live for Christ. And we may find ourselves only meeting people like that every now and again. But right before you throw in the towel, right before you think that this isn't worth it, this life of Christianity, this life dedicated to the faith, just before you quit and say, hey, I don't know what's going on, but this is for the birds. Just before you give up, I want to remind you that the path that you're on is the narrow path, and it's supposed to be this way. And once you determine that the destination is more valuable, it's more valuable 
than how many people you run into on the same path. I promise you, you'll be happy about it and you'll be glad that you stayed the course. Look, thanks, Bishop Williams. This is my covenant brother. Just want to let you know I love you. I was really encouraged behind that message. Look, we've got a hot topic for tonight. I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about some things um, and see if we can make the word of God kind of relevant uh, to what uh, is happening in this day and in this hour. As you know, the life program, living in faith effectively. We're talking about living it out, the faith, living it out practically, living it out in the midst of what's going on, because we believe that Christ did not just leave us this faith for us to put it in a box and keep it on the inside. He said, hey, don't be like that person who lit a candle and then went up on a mountain and hid it or on a hill and hid it under a bushel. No, we don't want to hide it. We want the light to be seen which means we have to live faith effectively and practically before people, even in this world. And so before I even mention what this topic is going to be, I'm going to give out the number so that those of you who may want to call in and chime in, I'm hoping that you all will. You can call in and let's chat a little bit about this. The number is 248-796-8241. Again, 248-796-8241. And I'm hoping you'll get in on this hot topic on tonight. So I am uh, learning a lot more about how to really use this Facebook, you know, and what it's really meant for. And unfortunately, a whole lot of people uh, send me crazy things sometimes, right? Some of the things that I just despise are these fights and things that take place that just show violence in the world and things that are going on in the world. And... Oftentimes, I am stunned as I'm watching some of these videos or I'm watching or listening to some of these things that have happened or reading these stories. I'm kind of appalled at and confused about why this bystander apathy, you know. Uh, for instance, someone sent me a video of a young man who's standing before a woman who is sitting down. Uh, and there are other people who are sitting around watching him literally verbally torment this woman. And then just out of the blue, about 60 seconds into this video, he just hauls back his arm, opens his hand, and he just slaps her and knocks her like clean out. Like she's literally falling back and she's just out of it, right? And then he's talking even more. These uh, verbal atrocities are just given to her and given to her over and over again, right? And, and I'm wondering, why is everyone else just sitting there, <laughs> letting this happen. This is one guy, right? Maybe two because someone was holding the phone, uh, video phone camera while he was uh, doing this. But there was still, there was only one person who was actually committing this violence. Uh, uh, so whether you want to talk about that or whether you want to talk about this uh, security uh, officer in the school who yanks this young lady up out of her seat for whatever reason, I think that everyone is in agreement that that might have been a bit too much. Uh, but he yanks her out, drags her around the classroom, throws her across the classroom, and everyone else is just sitting there, including the teacher who probably called him in in the first place, right? I'm just wondering, how is it that one person can do something and no one else moves to come to defense or to come to rescue or to even come to assistance. Uh, I'm watching this all the time. There's a situation where uh, a man is uh, uh, being attacked himself. And he's being attacked by two persons, unarmed, no guns, no knives even. They are physically, with their fist and their, and their legs, they're assaulting this guy. And they're literally... 14, 15 other guys who are standing around, men who are standing around, who this young man who's being jumped on is actually with. And guess what they did? They did nothing. I am wondering, not so much from the world, because I know all the axioms that we teach one another, right? We teach people that, you know, there are only two things, you know, in the, in, in the world that I have to do, right? And, and that is, I have to mind my own business and leave yours alone, you know? I've heard that before. I've heard people uh, uh, talk about how to mind your own business, how this has nothing to do with you, all the things that could happen if you get involved, and how you don't really know what took place before 
for this and, and you don't put your life on the line for anyone else. And I'm wondering, is that really Christian? Is that really the way that we are supposed to respond to different atrocities, to different violent acts, different things that go on in the world, situations, problems, whatever it is that may arise? Is a Christian or is the Christian church, is the Christian faith, are we really mandated to stand back and do nothing as these things happen? I think it's a really deep question because I've heard it amongst Christians. Hey, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Hey, as long as it's not me and mine, you know. Hey, uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not any of my business. And so I want to pose the question tonight. How involved are Christians expected to be uh, in other people's business uh, in things that go down, in things that happen clearly in your sight. I mean, are we supposed to be completely involved in helping people out? Are we supposed to be somewhat involved? Are we supposed to uh, uh, learn uh, how to stay out of it? Or, or what, what's supposed to happen? What is, what's the Christian church supposed to do? Are we supposed to feel good that, hey, you know, I watched someone uh, in a car accident, but, you know, hey, it, it didn't have anything to do with me, so I didn't have time to stop. It. I mean, how involved are we supposed to be? Are we supposed to be as involved, uh, a little involved to where, hey, we just kind of stand back and we yell and say, hey, you better stop that? <laughs> or are we literally supposed to jump into the midst of the fight and say, hey, break this up? Or, I mean, what exactly are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to be involved at all? Well, I think that there is some, some Bible on this subject, you know, uh, and I kind of want to pull some scriptures out. And again, you know, a little bit later on, I definitely want you to chime in and uh, let's discuss this and, and see what the Bible has to say about it and what our discussions will yield as fruit. So, of course, the first story, obviously, that I want to read with this story is I want to talk a little bit about Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37 in the King James Version. You know uh, exactly what this story is about. Some of you knew it exactly as I said, the book and the scripture. So let me read. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, two pennies, and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever you spend on him, more than what I've given you, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go. And do likewise. Now, let's just talk about this. We got some other scriptures and verses we could deal with, but let's just spend a little bit of time with this. See, this story is really dangerous, right? Because it starts off as an innocent story, and as an innocent story, Jesus starts telling it almost kind of sounds like a parable at first, but you know it's not a parable because it's not something that is full of uh, hyperbole, right? This is literally something that could and on any given day, be witnessed. It's a dangerous story because of that fact, that it's not a parable. And it seems like something that at first you could just kind of read over and say, hey, that was good for that good Samaritan. But then Jesus seals the deal. He says at the end, go and do thou likewise. Whoa. <laughs> okay, let's step back for a second. Here's a guy who is on his way to, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's actually leaving 
the place of praise, the place of worship, the, the place of prayer. He's actually leaving the capital and he's on his way back to the worst place, to Jericho, to the red light district. He is on his way there. While he's on his way there, with, I mean, just leaving the praise fellowship, just leaving the worship service. This guy is on, on a spiritual high. He's got his blessings. He's headed back to where he's come from. And on his way back, thieves, they fall on him. They strip him. They beat him. We know they beat him because they wounded him, right? And they left him for dead. And then three Types of people walk by. Now, Jesus does this on purpose, right? He starts with, you know, the, 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 the spiritual leaders, right? The priest, the church leaders, the persons who are, who, who are armed and equipped with the standard of moral value in the earth. The priest looks at him and says, hey, I don't want to get involved. That's none of my business. I don't have anything to do with that. What if I go over there and start helping him, and then uh, the thieves see me helping him, and then they rob me? I better get out of here. So he keeps going. The Levite represents just someone from the tribe of, of Levi. So they are not necessarily still held to the standard of leadership, but uh, they're the ones who are spiritually spiritually representing both the word of God and the presence of God. So now you're just talking about congregational people. You're just talking about the everyday Christian, right? Because we are all called to be these Levites, these high priests, right? We're all called to be spiritually connected, spiritually representative of Holy Spirit. But guess what he does? He walks on the other side of the street, says, hey, that's none of my business. Maybe I better do something else. Protect myself. Look out for number one, uno numero. That's what it's all about. He crosses on the other side. Now here comes this Samaritan. The person that would be the least likely to help someone who is Jewish or of Jewish descent. He's not a high priest. He's not a Levite. As a matter of fact, a high priest and a Levite they wouldn't even have anything to do with the Samaritan, let alone the Jewish person whom he's about to touch. They weren't even allowed to be touched by Samaritans. Samaritans were considered as filthy. <laughs> but here's this Samaritan who comes by, who seems to have more morality and more spirituality than this priest and than this Levite. And he goes over to him. He doesn't care anything about how it's possible that uh, the guys who were thieves may see him helping and then come and rob him and leave him in a worse predicament. He, he wasn't looking at his own life. He wasn't thinking about perhaps if he had a family. He wasn't thinking about them in the moment. He wasn't thinking about his own self-preservation. There was no selfishness in him at all. He had an impact that hit him from a note of empathy and he said, let me go and help this man. This is my moral responsibility. This is my spiritual responsibility. And not only did he go over and dress his wounds and, and, and clothe him and, and wrap him, and he did more than that. This guy went all the way. He got completely involved. He went as far as to put this guy on the back of, of, his, of his donkey, uh, you know, and take him down to the hospital, put him in the hospital, see the doctor for him, pay his medical bill, and then says, if you spend more than this, doc, guess what? Here's my address. <laughs> Here's where you can find me. Let me know and I'll come back and take care of the rest. Even though I know that his culture doesn't necessarily connect with mine, even though I know that his religious beliefs are not necessarily connected to mine, even though I know that you know uh, we're not on the same page as it results or relates to who is the real savior or who God really is or how we should worship God or where we should worship him in the mountain or in the valley, you know, hey, 
and all of that, we're, we're, we're still not there. But I do see him as a brother. And so whatever he owes, charge it to my bill. Well, that seems like 100% involved. I think that's what Christians are called to do. I mean, Jesus kind of says it when he asks, so which one of these three do you think was the kind of neighborly that I'm talking to you all about being? Someone spoke up and said, well, actually the third one. And then Jesus hits us with the okie doke. He says, go and do likewise. You now go and do that. When you see people who have, been, who have fallen on the side of the road, when you see people uh, whom have lost their way, when you see people whom have been left for dead, when you see people who have been stripped of all they have, when you see people who have been, who have been put in predicaments where they're wounded and they're hurting and, they, have, and they, they, they can't help themselves, you are called to be neighborly to them, to involve yourself in that situation, to be drawn in and to be involved in a way where it is complete, in a way where it brings about full restoration. And I think that that is so important. You know, I hear a lot of people these days, you know, everybody is really connected to this concept of relationship, right? And they say, oh, you know, I'm not religious. I am, uh, I, I'm, re I'm relational, right? I have a relationship with God. God, Jesus doesn't want anything about religion. Jesus didn't come to die for religion. Okay, and, and you're halfway right. <laughs> I think that first we need to really have a definition of what religion is before we just kind of shoot it out. Now, I want to proceed the reading of this scripture. I want to proceed it by saying this. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Relationship, obviously, yes. But I want to let you know that all lasting, intimate relationships start with religion. You don't believe it? Let me read this scripture and then I'll explain it to you. In James chapter 1, verse 26, 27, he says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Basically, to be involved in helping and assisting people through the problems in their lives and then keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That's true religion. That's pure religion. That's the religion that we're all called to have. So what was my statement about this whole practice of religion and how that comes before relationship? Well, when I started dating my wife, you know, some 28, 29 years ago, right? Teenager, young boy in love, right? And, and when I started dating her, uh, guess what I had to do? Before I could build or the way that I built the relationship with her that one day led to marriage was I had to religiously go and see her. <laughs> if I didn't go and see her at least once or twice a week, <laughs> well, someone else... It might have taken my spot, right? Someone else built that relationship through their religious practice, repetitively just doing something. If I didn't religiously call her every day, and I mean those calls, they, they happened every day. I was very religious with those calls. Sometimes I call so much, I fall asleep on the phone. Have you ever had that happen? You fall asleep on the phone, and you wake up about 6 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and then someone, or actually someone wakes you up, and you're like, I was asleep. And yes, you were. Right? It's kind of like the phone and the television. All happens the same way. You have to do that religiously in order to do what? In order to build that relationship. See, a relationship with Christ is the extension, is the moving beyond having a pure and undefiled religious practice. And so this religious practice that we're supposed to have that leads to or that helps to build that relationship with Jesus Christ is one that we religiously, over and over again, we love people, we help people, we assist people, we support people, especially people 
who cannot help themselves in any given moment. And so again, I think it's crucial that we understand Jesus says, go likewise, do this. You also be neighborly to people by helping them, getting into their situation, getting into what they're dealing with, because that is so very crucial. Now, let's go to the love factor, right? And so John uh, chapter 15, verse 12 and 13 this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. See, Jesus keeps saying stuff like that. It would be fine if he had just left it at, this is my commandment, that you love one another. If he had said that and there was a period at the end, it would have been perfect. Why? Because then we could have defined what that love was. <laughs> We could step back and say, hey, I am loving my brother by completely ignoring what he's going through. I am loving my brother by completely walking by as he's going through trouble, as he's wounded on the ground, bleeding out, crying out. I, I can't, you can't tell me that I didn't love him by not helping him. But Jesus doesn't put a period there. He puts a comma there, and then he adds himself to the equation. The commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay, Jesus, you just took it from zero to infinity <laughs> with just that one clause. So not only am I commanded, not asked, I am commanded to love my neighbor as you have loved us. I'm commanded to do that. And then it gets really deep. For greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Wow. There's a whole lot that goes with this, right? Because a lot of times when I've heard people use this scripture about greater love, you know, uh, have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. People use that in a way of explaining Jesus' love towards us. <laughs> but they don't recognize that when they make that comparison, Jesus has already made that comparison. But he wasn't talking about himself. He started that verse, that sentence, with giving us a commandment on how we are to love one another as he has loved us. And what he is saying when he brings in that last part, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, that doesn't become a testimonial of what he has done for us. This started out as a command of what we are to do for one another. It just got deep. Why? Because now this becomes a bar. He's saying to us, I am telling you that this is the kind of love that I'm talking about, that you're willing to lay down your life for your friends. Because after all, if that's what I'm doing for you, and if that's how I'm showing love for you, then... I just commanded you that that's how you are supposed to show love one to another. Is it possible that evil is on such a heightened reign? Because those of us who are good or who have good hearts or who have great intentions, those of us who sit back and we have spiritual power, we do nothing because we think we're outnumbered. We think that you know, there are more of them uh, than there are of us with the heart of Christ. And I'm here to tell you, that's not so. It's impossible. We may be outnumbered, if you want to say, in the moment in, the, in, in, in humanity numerics, but we are not outnumbered as a result to even the heavenly host. I don't even have to bring God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit into this. I'm just talking about the angelic host. Only one-third of the angels got kicked out. That left two-thirds. I'm not a great mathematician, but two-thirds, I think, is more than one-third. <laughs> uh, it's so crucial to understand this, that, hey, here we are in this place. Uh, uh, we are not outnumbered. God says, if I am for you, then I am more than the world against you. We can think of other scriptures that talk about, hey, if one can put a thousand to flight, if one can put a thousand on the run, then two can put 
Ten thousands. I mean, look at how this is working. We are not outnumbered. We're not outfashioned. We're not outbranded. We cannot be conquered. So how involved are we to be? Well, the Bible seems to truly be lining up here. <laughs> seems to be lining up. Seems to be saying the same thing. Okay, so okay, so then define this love. Define this love that the Bible is talking about. Well, let's do just that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, the love chapter, right? Let's go there and see what it says. It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity does not vaunt itself, does not puff itself up, does not behave itself unseemly, does not seek her own, it is not easily provoked, and it thinks no evil. But charity, it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. That's that perfect love. He goes on to talk about how now there only abides these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Someone once asked me before, they said, hey, why, does, uh, why do you say love? And the King James Version says charity. I actually like the King James Version's reading of this in this particular sense because charity is deeper than love. So you might take the love and look at it as just the action, I mean, as just the emotion. But charity takes the emotion of love and puts it into action. So someone once said, it's not really love unless you give it away. It's not really love unless you do something with it. It's not really love unless you act on it. And so this love that we need to act on, this love that we need to give away, this love that we need to show, I believe that it comes out in greater dynamics when we're dealing with the people of God, and particularly those who, hey, they're wounded, and they're bleeding, and they're down and out. How do we do that? We have to be involved. We have to be willing to get our hands dirty. There are some times when we have to step in and, hey, we do have to uh, 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 be in, engaged in what people are going through and what people are dealing with in the moment. Jesus was once asked in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Wow. Jesus, there he is, stating it again. Love is the key. Love is the factor. There are a whole lot of people running around. One of the excuses that we use to not get involved in people's lives, involved in people's predicaments and situations is we say, hey, you know, God understands. But God knows my heart. God knows I love him. But God is saying here through his son, we're not just called to love him with everything we have. That's really being involved. But we're also to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. As we love ourselves. Once again, here's some more scripture for you. Matthew 10, chapter, uh, verses 24 through 28. Jesus says these words. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. 
If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be made known. What I tell you in darkness, that ye speak ye in the light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye up on the housetops. And here it is. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Those are Jesus' words. In your King James Version, that's written in red print, red ink. That means Jesus said it. People say, well, Jesus doesn't even hardly talk about hell. He just did right there. And guess what he centered it on? He centered it on the disciple thinking that he does not have to live his life as the master has lived it before him. If we are truly disciples of Jesus Christ, then we are to follow the example that he has laid out for us. And it's a tough example, but it is one that bears following. If we're going to reign with him, we must also suffer with him. If we're going to live with him, we must also die with him. This means this exchanging of our own will, this exchanging of our own ways, exchanging of our own beliefs and our own attitudes and our own self-indoctrination. We've got to change all this stuff and we've got to turn it over so that we can adapt to who he is in us and allow him to grow in us. Now, just a few more moments because I know there are some questions that you want to ask. You want to call in so bad to 248-796-8241. You want to call in so bad and you want to ask, so what am I supposed to do when people, you know, I try to help them, but then they don't help themselves. And what are you supposed to do when, when people get themselves in these predicaments and in these situations and then they just expect you to come and help them out? What am I supposed to do when people don't listen to me the first time? And I mean, am I supposed to just keep going and helping them? Well, well, well. First of all, let's use ourselves as an example to answer those questions. How often? Because remember, Christ is our example. We're not supposed to do this the way that we feel it. We're not supposed to do this the way that we think it. We're not supposed to do this the way that we have experienced it. We're supposed to do this the way that he has lived it before us. So what does that mean? It means that how often has he forgiven us and then we've gone back and done the same thing, but he still works with us. How often has Holy Spirit told us not to do something and then we've gone and done it anyway, and yet when we called on him, he came and answered us like this good Samaritan. How often has that happened? It's happened a whole lot. Well, if he's done that for us, what he has required us to do is to do that for others. Look, right here in Ecclesiastes, I'm here to tell you that does come some balance with that, right? Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Yes, there must be balance. But even with that balance, there is still expected to be some involvement in what people are going through what people are dealing with. We know that, you know, we're not always aware of the situation when we step into it, but we should at least do something. We should be compelled to do something. So maybe we ought to talk a little bit more, and maybe we will on the next show, we'll talk a little bit more about what are some things that we can do. I, I know this, one thing that every Christian can do, right? You can pray. <laughs> you can pray. I mean, it's amazing that even in the story of the Good Samaritan, the priest wouldn't even pray. <laughs> even if he wasn't going to go over there and physically get involved, he could have at least prayed. He didn't even do that. The Levite could have at least 
called someone else to come and take care of the situation. He didn't even do that. All of these different ways that people could have been involved, and they didn't do it. The Samaritan had to come along and become completely involved. So look, can I play a song for you? I want to play a song, Empathy. Empathy is all about this quality that put yourself in the other person's shoes. I believe that that is exactly what it took for this Samaritan to stop. The Samaritan had to see this man and his situation as himself. And if he were in that predicament, would he want someone to put himself, themselves in his shoes? Let's listen to this song. We'll be right back and take some calls. Welcome back. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed that tune, Empathy, Decent Music. It was a great track that had a lot to do with just trying to explain to people that 
one of the things I believe is missing from the world, and that's empathy. Look, I want you to call in. We've got a few moments left here, about 10 minutes. I want to hear from you tonight on this subject. How involved do you believe Christians are expected to be as it relates to other people's experiences, situations, whether good or bad? How involved do you think Christians should be? The number is 248-796-8241. Again, 248-796-8241. Really hope to hear from you tonight. Uh, while I'm waiting, there was a situation I was watching. Uh, it was a, uh, Actually, I believe it was earlier this year or either late last year. A uh, lady uh, in New York was carrying a baby, and she got onto one of, the, uh, one of the trains there, the subways, and a man followed her on and was asking to see the baby. And apparently the lady did not know this man, uh, uh, but he was being very adamant about seeing the baby. She didn't know him, so she wouldn't let him see the baby. And so he just really became very, very aggressive. And there was a woman who was standing on the back of the train who moved up toward the front. And she literally, she got physically in between the two of them. And she planted her arms on the two railings to keep the woman and the baby on one side and this man on the other side. And you couldn't hear on the actual video what she was saying uh, because they were on the subway. But as she was talking to the news uh, caster, he said, well, what was it that you were saying? And she said, I just kept saying, in the name of Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. You're not getting through here. And he tried a couple of times. He made some attempts to physically remove her. But after uh, uh, those failed attempts, he just left. He left the whole train, he just left her alone. I'm talking about that kind of involvement. Are we really called to get that involved, to be that involved in what people are going through? It was amazing to me because, again, everyone else, they just kind of sat around and watched. They just kind of sat around and looked and he just kind of sat around. Maybe some of them thought, hey, maybe she knows this guy and, and maybe she's hurt this guy or maybe she's done something to him and we don't know the whole story so we better not get involved. Maybe even there were some people who sat on that train and said, you know, well, when I went through something similar, nobody helped me. <laughs> so I don't want to get involved in other people's business. There probably were some sitting there saying, hey, I remember the last time I tried to help somebody out, and then they turned on me while I was, I was only trying to help them. Whatever it was that they thought while they were sitting there, no one but this woman seemed to think about empathy. What would it feel like to be on a train helpless with your practically newborn child trying to get from one place to another when all of a sudden out of the blue someone comes and aggressively starts just verbally assaulting you and, and, and physically trying to, to demand that you do something. Wouldn't you want someone to help you? Take it from someone who's been carjacked, take it from someone who is, who's been robbed, take it from someone who who has, who has been assaulted, take it from someone who has been jumped <laughs> on numerous occasions. I'm here to tell you, I was seriously hurt. It wounded me more that people would just keep walking as if nothing was happening. I knew they saw me. That was a deeper wound than any punch or any kick or anything else that happened physically. You just wonder if you were going through this, wouldn't you want someone to help you? I know I would. And I believe that that's what the Bible supports. I believe that that's what Jesus actually commands that we do. I believe that that is how he expects us to behave. And let me throw this nugget out to you before you start saying, oh, but what about the people that's out there doing evil? For all I know, this is them getting back what they've sown to others. Okay, well, let's go with that. This person here that we're speaking about in this one story, this was a person who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. So obviously, this was a worshiper. Obviously, this was a child of God. Obviously, this was a believer in the household of faith. This was someone who was a part of the fellowship. So even if you wanted to take it there, when someone's a part of the household of faith, 
We, we don't get to draw those lines. They're a brother. They're a sister. And we're supposed to engage them even as Christ has engaged us, especially in our worst moments, in our worst times. 248-796-8241. Got a few moments left. Just want to hear from someone tonight. Want to see how you think about. Uh, you know, we're here, and as we're talking about this subject, it's one that's very dear to me. I've known people who, you know, who have gotten jumped, who've gotten robbed, and they talk about all these people around. And it's amazing because working closely with the uh, Fifth and Ninth Precinct, as I do, and uh, with uh, police staffing and with law agencies across the city of Detroit, I hear that all the time from our officers. They say, hey, this crime happens here. We send our officers in to go and try to get invest, uh, do investigations and try to get information from the residents who, who we know were there. <laughs> they were there when this crime happened. They're the ones who called the police. But when we get there to get this information and do this investigation, everyone closes their doors. Everyone acts like the person who lives on their block, whom they've watched grow up, or whom is their neighbor. They act like they don't even know them. They'll see them on a gurney being, being pulled out or pushed out into the ambulance, and we'll say, hey, what happened? And they, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be a part. I don't want to, I don't want to touch this mess. I don't, I don't get in other people's business. So what are you supposed to do? How involved are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be as involved as your empathy will allow. You're supposed to think, number one, of how involved Christ is in your life on a daily basis. And then number two, you're supposed to think about what you would have others do for you if you were in that same predicament. Look, I want to pray tonight, and I want to leave you after this prayer with a song as I go off the air. It's a song that states, as if we cannot be what we've been once before. And I want you to think about the kingdom of God and the people of God and how we are to have this kind of unity if we're ever going to see the kind of power of God really come and funnel through and, and tunnel through the people of God to make an impact on this world. Will you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight. We thank you for giving us opportunities, because that's what they are, to be involved in people's hurt, be involved in people's pain, be involved in people's situations. Because with every opportunity that you give us to be involved, you also give us power to be involved. And we thank you for the power that you give, that we can help others overcome the turmoil and tragedies of this life and introduce them to a life of faith in you. Would you empower every listener? Empower them so that they will no longer ignore opportunities, but understand that that's what you are calling us to, that we may be in you. And we thank you for this unity. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, I want you to tune in. That's all the time I have tonight. I want you to tune in next week, 8 o'clock. We're going to talk some more about this subject. I want you to call in next week. Be a part of the discussion. Thanks so much. Listen to this song. And remember not to forget to live in faith effectively this week. God bless you.
just changes its color from the winter to the spring. It bays and changes brown, yet it grows back a stronger green. But could it die and resurrect to now from what it's been? If it were not a show that it could live again, as if we cannot be what we have been before, as if we can't achieve what we achieve no more. Don't give up on our dreams. And hope as we believe, and we will again be what we once were before. From Detroit to the nations, you are listening to the world's number one Christian station, Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. Hi, my name is Carolyn Abrams, and my show is Vintage Time. Listen to me every Saturday, 12 noon, right here on Worship Center Radio.